Let's talk about some of the big deals that we saw this week in the NBA. And let's start with the Philadelphia Clippers situation. <laughs> Philadelphia, of course, they signed Paul George. Uh, Four-year, $212 million contract with Paul George. Paul George heads to Philadelphia, where he will form arguably the best big three in the NBA. I've been looking down at the list, Mark. I mean, there are probably better big twos than either Embiid and George or Embiid and Maxi, but I'm not sure there are better big threes in the NBA right now. Durant, Beal, Booker, I don't know. I don't know. They didn't seem to work out that well last year uh, in Phoenix. But it, it gives Philadelphia uh, an all-star wing, a guy that shot the best numbers of his career from the field and the three-point line last season, who played 74 games last season. So he's, he proved to be durable last year. Um, I, I know there were some people that had hoped that Philadelphia would kind of use all that cap space to mix and match and get two or three different guys. I, I don't. I, I think this was a great deal. I think Paul George, as kind of 2A on that team, opposite Tyrese Maxey, is a home run. Paul George is adaptable. We saw that. He succeeded with Russell Westbrook in Oklahoma City, Kawhi Leonard, James Harden, he had to play with in, in L.A. Uh, I think he's going to be able to fit in seamlessly, opposite you know Embiid and Maxey. He's obviously motivated at this stage to to win championships uh, because he's had a long career, made a lot of money, won absolutely nothing <laughs> at this point. So um, I, I don't know about you. I, I love the fit of Paul George with the 76ers. Oh, great fit. And it was the 100% right move. And this has been the Sixers' priority you know, for a while now that they want to get a really good two-way wing player to uh, complement Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid. Um, you know, these aren't game changers, but it also helps that, you know, they did add some extra players with Eric Gordon, and Andre Drummond, just to get some depth. I think you hit on a really good note with Paul George. He can fit in with that anybody and he is a great two way player. He's very good at being, you know, either the number one, number two, number three player. I think because of that, on paper, they would be second in the East behind the Boston Celtics because, as you mentioned, Celtics basically have their whole championship core back and they are a well-oiled machine. But we do have to bring up the injury concerns, not just with Joel Embiid, but even though Paul George had relatively better health last season, injuries are still a thing to monitor him, uh, monitor with Paul George. The other thing that's an interesting irony with PG is that even though he is very good at adapting to his role, be, playing like a star player or being a glue guy or a role player, a mix of both. There have been moments during his time with the Clippers when Kawhi Leonard was out and he was being asked to carry the team. He's shown glimpses of being comfortable with that, but it could only sustain for so long. He didn't seem comfortable with being the long-term number one guy. And with Philadelphia, he's clearly not the number one guy, but if heaven forbid – there is a long-term injury that Joel Embiid has. I think that he could only hold the fort down for so long. But to your point, big picture, it's the move they had to make. Doesn't guarantee anything in the NBA, but the, the bottom line is you only have to do you, you have to do what you can to give yourselves the best chance to win an NBA championship. And the Sixers have been, you know, underachieving the last few years because of injuries biting themselves at the worst opportune times. Yeah, and I don't worry about Paul George, whether or not he's able or not able to step in and play a bigger role in the case of, of a serious injured Embiid. It's like with every team in the NBA, Mark, like you lose your best player, you're done. You're cooked. Like Tatum goes down in Boston, they're done. Uh, Jalen Brunson goes down in New York, they're done. Like, yeah, and, and no question, like Embiid's got to find a way to be healthy when the playoffs start. I mean, I'd like to see him play... 55 to 60 games next year. Like, don't worry about all NBA. Don't worry about crossing that 65-game threshold to, to win whatever awards. Just get that body at full strength uh, to the to the postseason. Like, because, you know, he's going to wind up playing 35, 40 minutes a game in the playoffs. And, you know, we watched this past postseason. Like, even though he was kind of officially healthy-ish, uh, he still was dragging that body around for for – much of the the playoffs. So, uh, you know, Embiid, I think, has to find a way to just ease into the postseason as close to full strength as he, he possibly can be. Uh, but fit-wise, it, it just works. It just works. I mean, Paul George is going to get a lot of open looks playing opposite Maxi and Embiid. Uh, he's going to be able to be a playmaker because Maxi is, you know, most of the time more of a scorer than he is a traditional playmaker. 
Uh, I, I think it's a round peg, round hole type of fit. I'm, I'm not surprised at all to see Philadelphia go to the mat and, and offer up all those years for Paul George. And look, maybe at the back end, it's a shitty contract, but whatever. Like, you've got like a three or four year window with Joel Embiid. Like, this is where you maximize his potential. And uh, going all in on Paul George, it's worth the risk of a couple of bad years on the back end of that deal. Um, from the Clippers' perspective, I, I don't really know what they're doing. I don't. Um, they were very clear and adamant that they were not going to go to a fourth year with Paul George. They were very clear that the best Paul George could hope for with them was the kind of three-year contract that they gave Kawhi Leonard. Um, I don't know why they held that position because, look, they knew Philadelphia was out there. Right? Like, if Paul George only had, like, even if it was just Orlando, right? Like, you're going to look at Paul George, like, you're really going to go to Orlando? Like, you're really going to spend the next four years of your career trying to win in Orlando. But they knew Philadelphia was lurking. They knew, you know, the kind, like, Daryl Morey doesn't, when stars are available, Daryl Morey goes after them. That's his MO. So they knew the Sixers were going to do exactly what they did. And yet, they held firm and wouldn't give Paul George that fourth year, which I guess is admirable in a way, but now what are they left with? Now you've got a 30-something-year-old Kawhi Leonard who has a history of injuries. You've got a 30-something-year-old James Harden who has a history of injuries. They went out and went on this like quasi-spending spree you know, over the last couple of days where they signed Derek Jones Jr. and Mo Bamba and Chris Dunn, Nick Batum, you know, bringing back Kevin Porter Jr. Apparently they were competing with lots of teams for him. I don't know if I believe that. <laughs> but like they signed a bunch of guys, and as I watch all these transactions with the Clippers, Mark, the only thing I can think of is like the, the Clippers, they look like a team that is trying to do whatever they can to avoid giving Oklahoma City two good draft picks over the next two years because the Thunder is sitting pretty right now. They have got the rights to uh, the Oklahoma City draft pick or the, the Clippers draft pick next year and then swap rights in 2026 on their draft pick. So the Clippers have no reason to lose here. Like they, they, they need to be as competitive as possible. And that to me is how they are operating right now. Just signing a bunch of guys that if they're all healthy, they're a play-in team. Like, I, I, you know, I, I saw like on Twitter, people like going after me like, uh, did you watch enough Paul George this year? Like Paul George isn't that good. Paul George is, is, is a negative. Paul, you know, get rid of Paul George. We're still going to be the four seed in the East or the West. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you think that, you are delusional. If you think that some combination of Nick Batum and Derek Jones Jr. and Kevin Porter Jr. are going to step in and replace the production of Paul George, you are crazy. Uh, that's, that's my take on it, Mark. What's yours? Yeah, it's fairly similar. Now, I'll share with you, and feel free to knock it down. This is just the Clippers' thought process, is that it's very telling that they cited the second apron concerns multiple times. Three and times, yeah. And it doesn't st – I don't think Steve Ballmer is, uh, you know, worried about his money inflow. He's shown that he's w had willingness to spend. But I think that they had long-term concerns for future seasons on how hamstrung it would uh, make them with, you know, rounding out the rest of the roster and diluting their effectiveness of having a full mid-level. Um, they wouldn't say this, but I – can't help but think that they were sensitive to the optics of giving Paul George a longer deal than Kawhi Leonard because Kawhi Leonard already committed, gave a little bit of a pay cut to theoretically make it more feasible for everyone to still stay on a contract. So I think that they didn't want to disrupt that. But the other thing that is puzzling is, you know, I've been told, and I know it's also out there among other reporters, is the Warriors – propose several different variations of possible sign-in trades involving some of their veteran players. So you look at some combinations of Chris Paul and Andrew Wiggins, Kevon Looney. There are even variations that included some of their young players like Jonathan Kaminga and the Clippers still said no to that. Do you and believe that, that part, though? Like, I, I don't, like, 
they're not trading Kaminga to get Paul George. Like I don't believe that. Like I just I just don't. Kaminga. I don't. I don't believe that they included all those names. But at least from what was relayed to me, that there were variations of different combinations to make a sign and trade happen, so that Paul George could get a max with the Warriors, and the Warriors liked him for the same reasons Philadelphia liked him, and the Clippers said no. Now the Clippers said in their statement generally that they declined doing any sign and trades because of the sec- second apron concerns. But to your point, that part made me scratch my head a little bit because the Warriors at least had some assets to work with, especially with their young guys. And they said no to that still. Yeah. I'm, look, the second apron concerns are legit. Like yeah. you mentioned this, like Steve Ballmer's not afraid of paying luxury tax penalties, but the reality is when you go into that second apron, your ability to flesh out your roster becomes significantly uh, more difficult. So I get that. I just think that ultimately the Clippers, they made their deal with the devil years ago. Like they brought these guys in. Uh, it was the right move at the time. Both of them in their 20s, true all-stars, Kawhi coming off a championship. I get it. But I, I think they almost, I, I would have doubled down on it. I would have said, you know what? This is who we are. We're going to bring James Harden back. The Harden deal was was wild to me. Like, you're bringing James Harden back on a two-year deal at $70 million? Who are you bidding against? Like, who exactly was out there looking to give James Harden more than, say, the mid-level exception? If that. If that. Like, James Harden's, what, 35, 36 years old? Uh, who was out there that wanted to give him two years and $70 million? Like, I... Th- I like to think I'm decently plugged in across the NBA. I don't know who that was. I don't know who the Clippers were sitting back going, oh man, we got to give James Harden 70 million because, you know, the Dallas Mavericks, you know, they're, they're clearing cap space or Orlando, you know, Orlando, this Orlando, the Orlando magic, which prioritized defense more than any team in the league. They're going to give James Harden $35 million a year. Like who were they bidding against? That was, that was wild to me, Mark. Like, of, of all the things that went down, like, if they get James Harden back in, like, two years, $25 million, I'm like, all right, cool. That's that's what it is in the NBA. But $35 million? Like, James Harden, th- this man keeps winning. Like, he just keeps winning. <laughs> Not on the court, but off the court. He keeps winning. He, he Everywhere he goes, he winds up getting paid. And if he doesn't like it there, he forces his way out to exactly where he wanted to go, and he gets paid again. Like, this guy, this guy is a off-season winner. You could say that, but at the same time, say he does not demand a trade with Philadelphia, right? They got Paul George because they had him off the books, and you do wonder if he had just played out the rest of this past season, even though he's upset with Daryl Morey, not that he would have gotten Paul George's deal, but he would have gotten rewarded in some respect, and now you weigh which team has a better chance to win a championship. But I think to your broader point, yeah, he didn't have a robust market, but internally – the Clippers were relatively pleased that he was able and willing to adjust his game, adjust his role, still be productive. And I think that they were comforted with the fact that even though it was $35 million a season, it was two years as opposed to a multi-year contract. So there is some more flexibility than otherwise. You're, you're crazy. <laughs> you're, you're, you're crazy. If, if you- I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm just relaying – what they're thinking. Oh, no, I've heard it. I mean, I've, I, I've heard it. I've heard it. I, I don't, I don't buy it that one bit. Like you, you could have gotten James Harden for a lot less. You could have, I'm sorry. And meanwhile, you know, one of the byproducts of this Philadelphia Paul George deal, and you touched on it briefly, is like the Sixers own two first round picks of the Clippers in 2028. They got the pick outright. And I believe in 2029, they have swap rights to that Sixers pick. So, not only do they get better in Philadelphia by adding Paul George, but they they weaken a team that in three, four years, they've got their first round picks. Like it's a double whammy for Daryl Morey and the 76ers. I don't know. I don't know what the I don't I don't know. I don't know. I mean, again, it, it just it just seems like the only objective of the Clippers is not to bottom out, because if they bottom out they wind up like the Brooklyn Nets of the last decade where they're forking over two top three picks that turn into superstars for other teams, right? Like, you know, 
The Brooklyn Nets will forever be known as the team that gave the Celtics Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Like that, I think, that I feel like the, the Clippers are operating like that. They're not trying to win anything because they know they can't win anything with this group. But they're just trying to be as competitive as humanly possible. So whatever draft picks they got to fork over um, are, are not as bad as they potentially could be.